Law Warrior Armor Double Feature Fulcrum Heavy Hover Tank Overview Financed by the continued brisk sales of Alpha Trading Corporation's J. Edgar Light Hover Tank, the Fulcrum is fast, maneuverable, and easy to maintain. The first four prototypes of this vehicle rolled off the production lines in 3056 and performed so well in all tests that Alpha Trading received orders for 500 of them in mere four months. Alpha Trading has already filled the order and is gearing up its plant to build another 1,000 Fulcrum tanks. Capabilities Built for rugged endurance and easy maintenance, the Fulcrum is well armed and armoured. An XL engine gives the Fulcrum a top speed of 175 kph, making it tough to hit. The new engine is simple to maintain with access panels on the rear deck and in the main compartment. The engine can also be replaced in the field. In fact, during testing, a team of techs removed a defective engine and installed a new one in less than three hours. The Fulcrum is equipped to carry out a variety of missions, though its primary mission is reconnaissance and fast strike. The Fulcrum's weapons are simple but effective. The Sunglow Large Laser and Delta Dart LRM-10 have been used for hundreds of years and have a respectable reputation throughout the inner sphere and the periphery. A medium laser rounds out its weapons, and so far, the only complaint about its firepower is the fact that it only carries a single ton of LRM ammo. In a long battle, the supply just runs out. To hide the fulcrum from enemy units and allow it to screen friendlies, the designers installed a Guardian ECM suite. The vehicle also carries tag and can act as a spotter for units equipped with Arrow 4 missiles. The Fulcrum's armour is specially designed for hover vehicles, as the bulk of the Fulcrum's 10 tons of armour cover the front and the turret. And finally, the craft's 11 heat sinks allow the Fulcrum to fire its energy weapons almost constantly without risk of overheat. Deployment The Fulcrum has yet to see combat, though the Lyran Alliance has stationed several lancers of them along the borders with the Free Worlds League and the periphery. 3058 Upgrade Overview In 3055, the Sky-based Cyclops Incorporated decided to engineer a new state-of-the-art hover tank to succeed its brisk-selling Drillson heavy hover tank. The first four prototypes of the new Fulcrum rolled off the production lines in 3056 and performed so well in all tests that series production started in March 3057. Cyclops Incorporated received orders for 500 Fulcrums in a mere four months. Following the Fedcom Civil War, Johnston Industries on New Certis started building a licensed version of the Fulcrum Heavy Hover Tank due to the high demand for new ones, as both of the once allied states had rebuilt their forces. Cyclops Incorporated was forced by long-term contracts to supply the AFFS as well. Capabilities Built for rugged endurance and easy maintenance, the Fulcrum is a well-armed and armoured hover tank, whose high top speed makes it a tough target to hit. The XL Fusion Engine is simple to maintain, with access panels on the rear deck and in the main compartment, and can be replaced in the field in just 3-6 to six hours if one is new at hand. Since the Sunglow Large Laser and Delta Dart LRM-10 provide the Fulcrum with its long-range firepower, they've been used for hundreds of years throughout the Enosphere and the periphery, they're easy to maintain and able to be replaced. A medium laser rounds out its weapons configuration. The only major complaint about its firepower is that it only carries a single ton of ammo for the LRM and runs out of missiles fairly quickly during longer engagements. Its primary missions are reconnaissance and fast striking against enemy flank or rear positions, but its electronics payload allow it to carry out a variety of other missions. The Guardian ECM suite enabling the Fulcrum to hide itself and screening friendly units against enemy troops, and the vehicle also carries TAG and can act as a spot of units equipped with Arrow missiles. Deployment The majority of the first Fulcrum production run was stationed along the Lyran borders with the Free Worlds League and the periphery. The decision that quickly proved to be a good choice, since the Fulcrums were well suited for the task of patrolling the undermanned planets in this region. The low level of maintenance needed for the Fulcrum, along with the cutting-edge nature of its technology, boosted the morale of troops receiving them, since it was the first time in over 15 years that such technology wasn't confined to the clan border or to major planets. Following the Fedcom Civil War, Fulcrum hover tanks were primarily deployed to units within the Sky Province, the Freedom Theatre or the Capella March. Duke Robert Kelsworth Steiner's retaliation attacks following the second Syrian Lancer's assault on Sky, and Duke George Hasek Davin's preemptive strikes against the Capellan Confederation threw the Fulcrum contingents of both states into the thick of war. And during both initial attacks and counterattacks, Fulcrum hover tanks served exceptionally well in attack and retreat harassing enemy units, and trying to either gather combat information or slow down their opponents' advance by endangering their flanks and rears. Variants 
The only variant of the hover tank was introduced in 3067. It dropped the large laser and one heatsink in favour of two additional medium lasers and an SRM-6 rack with a single tonne of ammunition for more close-range firepower. Notable crews. Lieutenant Samantha Devereaux, Sergeant Sergei Mitchell, Private First Class Richard Huang, and Private Charlene Thomas. Lieutenant Devereaux was in command of the 2nd Reconnaissance Platoon, 18th Verlo Armoured Regiment of the 6th Certus Fusiliers RCT. She and her crew racked up an impressive account of 7 Capellan battle mechs and 21 vehicle kills during the Battle of New Certus. Lieutenant Devereaux's company was a constant menace to the Capellan troops' rear, harassing supply lines and attacking small patrols while using the sheets of ice and oceans of New Certus for a quick retreat, traversing terrain that few enemy scout units would cross in pursuit. Commandant Marcus Schmidt Iverson, First Lieutenant Maria Cassius, Staff Sergeant Harold Munkenberg. Commandant Schmidt Iverson commands one of the most expensive tanks throughout the whole inner sphere. He and his two crewmen are reconnaissance specialists of the Lyran Military Intelligence Division, and their fulcrum, Nachtula, or Night Owl, is highly customized, replacing most of the usual weapons with additional electronics, along with passive and active stealth mechanisms that enable it to operate on enemy planets or deep within enemy terrain for extended periods of time without ever being noticed. Now, this one is a bit weird. Um, yeah, you would have heard in the first book that it said it was the Alpha Trading Corporation, and then in the updated one, it's the Cyclops Incorporated and Johnston Industries. And here's the weird thing. I think both do build it, but for some reason, the original TRO says it was the Alpha Trading Corporation that made it, and then the updated book then says it's the Cyclops Incorporated. So I don't actually... <laughs> know what went on there uh but either way it's a 50 ton hovercraft again it's a strand 265 xl fusion engine for a power plant as a cruise of 108 and a flank speed of 162 kph its armor is star slab 11.5 type hva its armament is a single sun globe type 2 large laser a diverse optics type 18 medium laser and a delta dart lrm 10 launcher manufactured in this case by cyclops incorporated in johnson industries Primary factory on Sky and New Certus, respectively. Its communication system is the Op Air 900, and its targeting and tracking is the RCA InstaTrack Mark 12. This translates into a cruise of 10 and a flank of 15 speed wise. It has 11 heatsinks and it has a pretty generous armour complement of 46 on the front, 27 on the side, 20 on the rear, and 40 on the turret. Most of the weapons are located in the actual turret itself, the large laser, the medium laser, the LRM-10, the ammo is located in the turret as well, and it's got the Guardian ETM in the body and the tag laser in the front, which makes sense. Uh, to an extent, although you'd think maybe the tag laser should have been located maybe in the turret to allow it better ability to move and look at the target as it was moving to you know, laser it, and I would put the medium laser maybe in the front of the hull, I don't know, uh, since they both weigh the same. Wouldn't really be a big deal, but whatever. Um, yeah, uh, interesting vehicle. It doesn't do anything particularly special. It's not trying to be, you know, fancy. But it's a, it's a good utility vehicle, essentially. You're not using this thing to go out and take down enemy mechs or, uh, you know, perform raids. It does what it does well in that it's a reconnaissance vehicle with some decent ability to reach out and touch enemies if they detect it or... If it suddenly does have to go on the offensive, it, it can. Uh, I like the fact that it's a, it's a utility tank. It's built to uh, help move friendlies into a better position without coming under fire, and it can actually mark targets for off-map artillery. So it's got some, yeah, it's got a lot of versatility there. It's also a unit that you could bring in as uh, as a threat, in the sense that it's got a little bit of punch with that large laser and, and the LRM-10, but at the same time. Uh, it's not so deadly that it'll outright kill a player mech in, in like a turn or two, unless you get obviously really lucky, but that's the case of any weapon system in the game. Um, so you could have one of these in a lance, and it, yeah, it's a little bit different, a little bit deadly, but it's it's yeah, it's not gonna it's not gonna ruin anyone's day. You're not gonna get any uh, big bottom lips at the table kind of thing. Um, alternatively, it's a good thing for players to be able to have access to because it's the type of vehicle that they that you could craft a, an adventure around for MacQuarie RPG with uh, with players obviously moving around in one of these vehicles uh, on, a, on a mission where they're having to recon and you know using player skills to navigate areas quietly and stay hidden that kind of thing gathering the intel and getting out of the area maybe being detected and having a, ooh, a thrilling chase to get away kind of thing 
that kind of thing. So it's, um, yeah, it's not a bad vehicle. Again, it's just one of those functional ones. It's it's not going to be remembered by most people. You know, it's not a Manticore or a Shrek or uh, a Maxim hover tank or, or any of those kind of things. It, it's just a simple, simple vehicle with a little bit of new tech built into it just to, you know, give it some utility on the field and uh, that's exactly what it does and it's exactly what the Battletech universe needs a lot more of to be honest just those kind of run of the mill used by specific faction type vehicles the same with mechs you know just to sort of flesh out their um the factions and what kind of things they rely on individually so yeah but that's that's me rambling for a bit uh yeah have a good one thanks for listening as always uh, we've run out of max in the 3058 TRO, uh, so I'm, I'm I'm rounding out this TRO with the with the vehicles and the upgrade 3058 model also has uh, the battle armors, which I'll get to as well. Which I think I've only ever covered the Grey Death and maybe the standard Inner Sphere battle armor, but there there are a lot of us in there. I mean, as you know, you got the the uh, uh, Achilles, you know, the Grey Death Scout model, Infiltrator, the Kage. Cavalier, you know, all the different, uh, like the Fasher, like the, the different types made by the different um, Great Houses, Infiltrator Mark II, and then you've even got the the weird clan ones, like the, like the Gnome Battle Armor and, and strange shit like that, and Sylph and Salamander, and yeah, they're all they're weird and they're all shit that if you ask people to, you know, like name a, a clan Battle Armor, most people just go Elemental, and that's about it. <laughs> so there's a lot of weird, weird armors out there. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll get to them in the future. Well, until then, have a good one, everybody. Thanks for listening, and I will catch you next time. Bye-bye.